Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this fellow went on a journey and he gave his three servants gifts. They weren't asking for them, but they were given. Grace, you might call them, freely given gifts. Vast sums of money, five bags of gold, two bags of gold, one bag of gold, each according to who they were, their ability. Then he left on this long journey and the first fellow, the one uh, who had been given five bags, took what he had been given and exerted himself he took some risks, and over time, what he had been given grew in value, doubled. The second fellow, who had been given two bags, took what he had been given, exerted himself, he took some risks, and over time, what he had been given grew in value, it doubled. The third fellow was, was afraid, and so he hid it, buried it, kept it to himself safe and secure. The master comes back after a long journey, the journey of a lifetime, you might suppose, you might say. This man, he look, man looks to see what his three servants have done over the course of a lifetime. The first fellow shows up to his long-awaited master and says, here it is. I have taken what you have given me and I have used, used it, I have exerted myself, I have worked with it, it has grown, and what was once five bags is now ten. The master, pleased that the servant has done what he intended, pleased almost beyond word, says, well done, my good and my faithful servant. You have been faithful and responsible with the gift I have given you. I will give you more. Come and share in your master's joy. The second fellow shows up to the long-awaited master. Here it is. Here is what you have given me. I have used it. It has grown. What was once two bags is now four. Right? He has taken this gift, this grace, and he has been responsible with it. He has used it in accord with the intentions of the master. And the master, pleased almost beyond words, says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and responsible with the gift I have given you. I will give you far more. Come, share in your master's joy. Notice that there is the same joy for the fellow who doubled five bags as there is for the guy who doubled two bags. Right? The first lesson of the parable is it doesn't matter what you have, it matters what you do with it. Right? I'm not complaining about what you have, uh, it's what you do with it. Right? The joy of the master is in, in how we, we handle it. The third fellow shows uh, his long gone master, the master he is afraid of, what he has done. He has taken the gift that he was given and he hid it, kept to himself alone, buried. And the master is, is disappointed. There's a sense of heavy sarcasm with, you know, at least you could have thrown it in the bank and got some interest off of it. Right? Interest, it's not much, but at least you could have done that. Right? And he takes the gift and, and gives it to the other fellows, and, and the third servant departs into darkness. The third fellow does not meet his master with joy because he seems to have fundamentally misunderstood his master. For he is concerned that his master is someone to be afraid of, someone who reaps what he does not sow, as he says, and so he is afraid and he refuses to take any risks whatsoever. And it's not like the first two took vast risks. They took five bags of gold and two bags of gold and they doubled it over the course of a lifetime, right? If someone comes to you and says, I'll double your money in a year, it's a scam, right? That's like Nigerian prince emailing you, could you please send me your bank account? I want to double your money in poor grammar, sign some weird name, right? That's not what we're talking about. This is like, do you think you could double your money over the course of a lifetime? Yeah, yeah, that's doable, right? That's possible, that's not huge risks, but there are some, they, they took some risks, they worked at it, right? So the third fellow though, he was given this, and he doesn't see himself as being empowered to go out and use it. He sees himself as afraid that he might mess up. Right? He is not empowered, he is afraid, and so while the first two went out and took some risks and trusted the third fellow, well, he misunderstood. He thought the master was someone to be afraid of, and so he sat on it. Now, this is the point in the sermon where it could go two ways. First, we could, go, we could start talking about talents, as in like you're talented at music or, 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 or et cetera, talented in this way or the other, but it really isn't. The word talent has nothing to do with what we think of as talents and skills and attributes. Talent is like more like the word we have for like leader. It's a cubic volume. 
right? A talent is a mass of gold. It's a, it's a, a cubic volume of gold. So it's, there really isn't, this is not a parable that discusses what you should do with your talent at paperwork or something like that. This sermon could also take a turn and start talking about money, that you know we have been entrusted with certain money and we need to invest it well or else. Eh, I don't think that's really what this, this is not a, a parable about good, solid Christian investment practices, right? I, I don't think that would, that's what the parable is focusing on. This parable is so obviously symbolic, right? There is one master, three servants, the third servant is the one you pay attention to, and they've been given something valuable. It's a story designed to make a point. It's highly symbolic, right? Talking about what we do with what we value most, right? Immense value. What do we value most? What's the most valuable thing in your life? All right? What is the thing? Go ahead, Hallmark Channel, Warm and Fuzzies. All right? What do you value most? My children. Children. Family. Family. All right? That's what we value. We value having, a, a, I value to see my wife smile. I value playing Candyland with my daughter and Fletcher running his train up and down my arm 27 times in a row, right? I value family. I value that I had dinner with an old friend on Wednesday and the night before I made dinner for a new friend uh, on this Tuesday of last month or this last week. I value that I show up here and I have a community to serve. Right? I show up, and, and we together, you are the people I serve, a place that I love. The things that we value most are not the things we can touch. Right? I can't touch the things I value most, forgiveness, acceptance, community, family, right? But I can't live without them. I can't imagine living without them. To be as concise as possible, what I value most is community gathered around Jesus. That's it. The thing I value most in life is community gathered around Jesus. There's nothing more important to me. Right? God has given us the ability to do this. God has given us the ability to gather together, and in doing so, we reflect the very nature of who God is. God is known as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. God is known as this, this sort of divine community, this divine family, and that we are able to do so as well, to gather as, in the same way. That is a gift. Right? It gives us what we value most, to be able to gather and be together. It is when we are living at our finest, we are most fully living into being made in the image of God, when we are together in the name of Christ. And so we take what we value most, Right, the relationships that bind us together, the community gathered around Jesus. And how does this parable, this, this little world, invite us to see how we handle that? Right? How does it shape us to understand our relationships and our community? If community is this great gift that God has given us, we see that it is meant to grow over a lifetime to double, which feels about right. Right? If you think about it, but if you start life with a certain amount of family, yeah, everyone starts with family, right? You start life with a certain amount of family, and by the end of life, hopefully, you have at least doubled your friends, your family, your community, the number of people that you love and serve, and the people that love and serve you. That seems like a good thing to do over a lifetime. Some of us are graced with more community than others, right? It's by our, the parable says, according to their ability. Some of us are capable of, are extroverts, right? And we have vast friendships all over the place and lots of friends and lots of family. And uh, that's the people with five bags of gold. And some of you are the extroverts. Not me, right? I, I, I might have two bags of gold. If I'm honest, I might be a one bag of gold type of person. Like, I love to go out and have coffee with folks. I, I love it. I, I, and, and at a certain point, I, I do need to go and sit by myself and just have some Andy time, right? It, it is a joy to me. I am, I am greatly glad to see that Jesus, the, the master is just as pleased at the guy who doubles the five as the two, right? Because, again, it's not how much you have. It's what you do with it. Right? The master has the same joy. Now what happens, I have to confess, is I get comfortable. You all ever get comfortable? You get comfortable. Right? You get comfortable with the friends you have, the family they have, the way you, you're living. And, and it's a risk to change. It's a risk to grow for new people, for new community. It's, it's, it's messy. 
Right? You never know what's going to happen. And it's not like mind-blowingly risky to go have coffee with someone for the first time. You're not putting your life on the line. But it might be awkward. You don't know. Right? Someone might talk about something weird or they might talk about politics. Right? You just don't know. Having someone over for dinner. Right? You have someone over for dinner and maybe they're going to like what you like. Maybe not. Right? I, I took someone out. I, I was in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, and I was so excited to meet someone at the church, like a young, idealistic intern, Andy. Yay! Right? I'm going to meet someone at the church. I took him out to lunch at one, one of my favorite places in Green City, this great ethnic Asian place, and I brought a lady who had never been in an Asian place in her life. She liked chicken and biscuits and gravy and steak and potatoes, and it was... Awkward. She literally didn't have anything to order off the menu, right? To, to, to meet someone, you, you, there are risks. You never know what's going to happen when you, when you meet someone for coffee or you have them over for dinner or you join a club or a group. You don't know what's going to happen. It might be not what you expect. And, and we can become risk adverse. We can be just kind of comfortable, both individually and as a church. Remember, Jesus is, is telling this story to the disciples, right? The disciples, and how long have the disciples been hanging out together? Three years, right? They have been, as everyone else have come and gone, they've been hanging out together for three years, and they've gotten pretty tight. You hang out with people for three years, day in, day out, right? And so this is Matthew 25. The next thing that happens, Jesus talks a bit about sheep and goats, and then we're to the Last Supper, and then the crucifixion and the resurrection, and off they go. Like, this is one of the last things Jesus says to the disciples. And this is kind of a good last thing to say. You 12, you're used to what you value most, leaning on each other. You're going to have to share. right? You're going to have to invite some people into this. You can't just stay the 12 of you. You're going to have to take some risks. And they did, right? He's talking about bringing Paul into the church. Paul, what, did, what was Paul known for before he started writing letters? He was known for persecuting Christians, right? This is far more risky than just having someone over for coffee and not being sure whether they like cream or, or whether they are going to be awkward about something with you, right? They took some risks. Thank God, because that's how we end up here. The difference between the first two servants and the third is that the first two were willing to take some risks. Not massive risks, not mind-blowing risks, but they were understood that they had been empowered to take what they value most. They had been entrusted with this community, and they shared it. The third fellow was scared, and he, did, he took no risks, and he did not get out there. And what happens to what you value most if you take no risks? Getting married, is that a risk? Having kids, is that a risk? Right? Making new friends, meeting new people, there are risks. And if you do not take these risks, what happens to your family and your community? It fades. Right? There's a sense in which, by the time the third servant goes to dig up the, 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 uh, the, the talent, the gold, he's taken no risks, it has not grown. Martin Luther points out, the reformer, as a Christian, you're either growing or you're shrinking. And I have to ponder, was there anything there to dig up by the time he got to it? Because if he has not expanded the family, if he has not grown the community, if it just fades away, he ends up in the darkness. And really, is there any better way to describe what it's like to live without community, without friends, without family, than darkness? For the ways that you have done what this parable describes, for the ways that you individually and for you as a church have done this, and you have, for the ways that you have taken risks to invite people into your lives, to grow, to grow as a community, to bring people into the shared community, well done. Seriously. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You're doing great. Right? For the ways that you have done that, Jesus is pleased. Right? Let us never forget that we have been entrusted with that. Right? We have been entrusted with something more valuable than gold, more precious than silver. We have been given this community gathered around Jesus and empowered to go and to take risks, to try new things, to allow people, uh, allow people into our lives together to be messy, right? to try it. 
Jesus, in one of, his, these, one of these, his last parables, leaves this note to the beginning of what will become the church to remind his disciples, you're going to have to invite some people in. Take some risks. Bring people into this. And in doing so, you will experience the joy of your master. Because nothing brings the master more joy than bringing people into this good news and introducing them what is most valuable, the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't forget the end of the parable, right? At the end of the parable, does the master take away the five talents that have been turned into ten? No. He says, here, let me give you more. Right? The two that have been turned into four, here, let me give you more. Right? The way we live today, inviting people into a relationship and sharing the thing that we value most, it is practicing for what the kingdom of God is like. It's practicing for heaven. Heaven is congruent. It's, it, it make, it's along the lines of how we are called to live today. We take risks to show what we have been given, to share it with others. More will be added to it until we, have, we join our master in the kingdom of God to come, the community of not just the saints we've met in this lifetime, but all of the saints gathered to, together in a huge, messy, wonderful family at Christ's table in a communion that will never end. Thanks be to God. Amen.